I think people are mistaking the end of times for what is actually the end of time. The digital media environment is very, very different from the analog one that went before. Think of the way clocks used to be. A clock was a big round thing with a second hand that went slowly around. It had a narrative arc to it almost if you watched a clock. Oh, it's a new minute, you know, and it's come around. Compare that to a digital clock, which is... <laughs> Wait for a minute. <laughs> There's no sense of the passage of time. We no longer have an organizing narrative. People are so desperate for an organizing story that they would rather believe that everything is going to end now in a fiery apocalypse than that it's going to somehow just keep on going, that we're going to stay in this perpetual now. Fell in love with a crooked world and everything that comes with it. Myself with none of it. I love when you take it, won't you? Hi, are you doom scrolling? How about texting a friend you missed to say hello? I'm known for something called doom scrolling reminders, which were tweets that I was manually writing and sending out at the, starting at the beginning of the pandemic around April 2020, telling myself not to look at my phone. Doom scrolling is very specifically the act of looking at your phone with the initial search for information and then being sucked in to information that is non-productive and also you lose track of time, and then you also, the utility of the information that you're receiving becomes smaller and smaller. You get sucked into petty arguments, armchair analysis. Hi, it can be tempting to doom scroll and lose more time than you expected. Is there an email you need to send? Food you haven't eaten? You caught me doom scrolling. I doom scroll so much. I've been trying to like not do it, but it's hard not to. It makes me feel <laughs> like I'm losing my mind when I come out of it, and it's like three hours later, and I'm like, what just happened? I doom scroll, and it's more so like I'm in a trance. I, I genuinely yeah. have no conception of anything that's around me in my physical, and, and then I kind of like look up or I'll move my phone, and I'm like, Oh, it's nighttime. Yeah. Oh, I had all this work to do. And then aside from that too, I'll be like, okay, I have to wash dishes. Let me find a long form video to watch. Cause like TikTok has the 10 minute video feature now. So I just listen to people talking and like, you can't just wash the dishes. You know what I'm saying? During the initial year of the pandemic, People were doing ridiculous things like buying huge amounts of stuff online, uh, trying to over-exercise within their apartments. And so for a lot of people, the easiest thing that they could have done was just stay up late and scroll on their phones because that felt like that was something within their control. I want to turn back time. This life was much better when I was nine. How can you sleep at night? When everybody knows it, everybody knows it. There is absolutely a pervasively unhealthy relationship that many people have with technology and information. And I don't think that's necessarily their fault. Many social platforms are leveraging our attention in ways that facilitate this circumstance. People post from all over the world. 
Central India. Underwhelming monsoon due to El Nino currents have failed to bring relief from the heat wave. London. I'm seeing roughly a doubling of tents and makeshift shelters popping up in parks and public spaces over the last six months. It's just these little things that you see out of the corner of your eye that add to the overall feeling of things spiraling down. Do miss the rise of anxiety when you're confronted with the reality of living in a corrupt, dysfunctional civilization that is at odds with the natural world. You have taken some form of step towards awareness. Definitely a spokesperson for the apocalyptic. <laughs> I, they'll never hear the end of it of like, we're yeah. in the end of days and it yeah. just feels really like a huge culmination of like every bad thing that's ever happened happening at once right in front of you. That feeling, that kind of feeling of like uh, World War III is coming or you know, something, something bad's around the corner. I definitely, definitely have that in the back of my mind. We live in such a weird time where we can see what's actually happening to people on our phones. It's not like, oh, you're hearing this, you're hearing that, you're watching videos. When the Ukraine invasion happened, I spent several hours reading about how poorly Russia had maintained its military based on photographic analysis of uh, wheels. <laughs> it's one thing to know that Ukraine is severely being affected. Most people don't need to know about how to analyze photographs of tanks and lack of tire maintenance among the Russian military. Like th those kinds of levels, climate change, wars, natural disasters, the economy, those banks, you can essentially read a PhD thesis on each of those topics on a daily basis and never get to the bottom of it and feel completely overwhelmed and loss of agency in response. Welcome to Siberia, London's first cyberspace cafe. Here you can sip a cappuccino and surf the internet, joining millions of others heading down the road towards the information superhighway. The, net began in 19 the internet gave us new possibilities. You know, it opened the door to start thinking about living and working in a more peer-to-peer -peer fashion in order to foster a new kind of human culture. It's all like very exciting and, I mean, I'd like to link up myself one day at home. When we gave the internet to people in the late 80s and early 90s, it unleashed all sorts of creativity and new possibilities. Oh, it's gonna be tremendous. You know, the dreams that we've had in the past of being able to access what's called the information superhighway and perhaps do our shopping out on, on the information superhighway, uh, do some banking perhaps. What happened though was once business people saw how exciting this, this internet was, um, they started to think about, well, how do we make money off this thing? The battle is already on to profit from this new age. So in order to increase the probability of very particular money-making outcomes on the net, we took these technologies and turned them from tools that unleashed wild possibilities to tools that we used on people to make them behave more predictably. If you're not the customer, you're the product, um, but we're more than that, we're, we're the labor force. Right? That's, we are working for the social media company when we dutifully enter in all our stuff and give them all our data. Think of how you feel when you get off the internet. You're exhausted, that's work and it's not exhilarating. It's, it is labor. So really they're just looking for different ways to monetize any single human behavior and then sell that back to us as some form of empowerment. The most common thing I said was, hi, are you doom scrolling? It made people feel present again in themselves, made them a little bit more aware of Maybe they had been on their phones for a long time. So I would often encourage people to take walks or do offline activities. There is very little guidance on what people can do, how it personally affects their lives, 
what they do and do not need to know that is essential. And then also what people are doing in response to try to make those things less horrific and doomsday-like. And I think that is a real issue with not only the media industry, but also forces that benefit from that chaos or that feeling of chaos among the general public. There are lots of people who have already felt a radical shift in their communities or countries even. If you're in the first world, white, or in a privileged place, you could go most days and not really encounter it whatsoever, yet. In 2017, I was reaching kind of a peak where my collapse awareness made me want to have a broader, more intimate conversation with anyone. Some of that probably was its own form of kind of romanticizing the time that I'm in and the time that I'm alive, and wanting it to be interesting. But I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. I think we are in interesting times. So I'm searching for the as I drown in my The Collapse subreddit is a online discussion forum. It's based in a larger platform called Reddit. There's about close to 500,000 subscribers. I've been a moderator for the last four years. The conversation is focused on the notion of collapse, so which is defined as a radical reduction in population or complexity across multiple systems for a significant period in a relatively quick range of time. The doom scrolling capital of the internet. I was interviewed for the journalist who wrote the article that called it that. I mean, he pulled it from the ether. It was already a notion, but I think a lot of people miss the point. The whisper on the wind is that the earth is suffering immensely. The other thing is it seems like humanity is a bit starved for its relationship with endings. The reaction to that is to then this loudspeaker appears within culture of people that are trying to point a spotlight in that direction. I had a single encounter with some billionaire doomsday preppers, you know, where I thought I was going to be giving a talk on the future, you know, digital technology, and it was just five tech bros who wanted advice on their bunkers, where to put them, how to maintain control of their security force, whether I thought there were reasonable plans or not. But it set me on a journey not to research billionaire preppers and their underground lairs, but rather how did the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world today come to believe that it's all ending? There's an obvious subset of the techno elite who will just be leveraging their wealth in an individualistic way to try to insulate themselves even further. I know people personally who left the States specifically to go to New Zealand because it sounded like a worthwhile refuge I think there is part of the sort of collective human consciousness that thinks of New Zealand as a place that's safe in the world from global threat. If you look at a bunch of different post-apocalyptic fiction, there's this place that's considered as maybe the saving grace of humanity. Having grown up around here in Queenstown, I already had sort of a socio-economic interest in how it was changing. And then in 2017, this journalist, Douglas Rushkoff, uh, wrote a piece talking about conversations he'd had with wealthy, powerful people in Silicon Valley in particular, about the way they were thinking about New Zealand as a place to escape to in the case of doomsday, essentially. 
from that there emerged reports on individuals and companies sort of saying, yeah, that's true, uh, I've seen a bunker there, or companies that sell survival bunkers saying they'd shipped them here. So that kind of spurred a conversation within New Zealand. I developed a documentary trying to answer the question of whether there were survival bunkers here or not. The doomsday people coming here to survive the world apocalypse. Yeah, it's a usual topic that pops up every now and again. Uh, previous life as an engineer, I got a few calls about whether this actually occurs or not. The old bunkers in the in the in the outback sort of uh, question. I'd put it as an urban myth. I think as council, we've never seen anything come across our desk asking for permission to put one in, but I mean, you think, is it something you actually ask for permission for? It's out there, but um, we embrace all types of people here. Kim.com, who was a European businessman, he bought a property out of Queenstown. He has this post from last year where he shows a picture of his property and the location looks very much like Wyan or Preserve to me and then he's got these solar panels down the bottom. I mean, his caption is ready for World War III with a nuclear symbol beside it. That's the helipad. Oh, that huge of Rolls Royce rolling through. Every time I roll up here, I'm worried someone's gonna run out of the gatehouse real mad at me. I've spoken with people who have excavated and built the properties here and they've talked about significant underground structures this is the center, I guess, of the conversation about the kinds of properties that are being built. We realize that a survival bunker is secret on purpose and that billionaires don't want to be accessible. They're worried about economic collapse leading to societal upheaval. Essentially, they're worried that the, their neighbors are going to turn on them. These are the people that are perpetuating our current economic system, profiting from it, and then preparing for its collapse in spite of the impact it will have on everyone else in the world. Most simply, the mindset is the idea that with more technology, you can solve the problems of the last technology and make more money in doing so this idea that you can somehow escape from the problems you are creating by doing what you're already doing faster. And it's the basic rule of capitalism. It's a race that ultimately doesn't work because it turns out the real world kind of is limited. Elon Musk asked, like, the brightest minds in the world, like, how much would it cost to end world hunger? And they actually did the math. They, like, took it seriously. They sat down and said, with six billion dollars, we could, like, really address this problem. He never did that. He said, like, tell me how much and I'll do it. Instead, he spent 44 billion dollars on Twitter. I mean, like, most post-apocalyptic fiction, that's what it's trying to get to the heart of. It's like, when you strip away all of the conveniences of our life. Like, who are we really? What we're talking about here with billionaires and their priorities and how they're preparing for an end of days, it's a similar thing, isn't it? It sort of reveals who they are, what their priorities are, and what they do with the power and wealth that they have. By the end of it, I didn't really care if people had a survival bunker underneath their properties because I did find it to be true that they were treating New Zealand itself as the bunker. The whole landscape of Queenstown's changed considerably with the billionaires coming in, more money's coming in, expensive shops. I suppose it's a safe place to come to, a good place to be if something does go wrong in the world. I think we'd go bush actually. <laughs> yeah. I think there, there's more resources and opportunities out, out in the forests, up, up on the hills. Anything could happen in this country, right? So as a Kiwi, we're pretty well equipped to pack up and go somewhere if we have to. Yeah, so yeah. No, the billionaires can have their bunkers yeah. and, and we'll, we'll go bush. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just preferably the summer. <laughs>
even if they have bunkers, it's a ridiculous strategy. Because, I mean, at some point you've got to come out. And it, by that point, you've alienated yourself from the community that will remain here. When you need more food, if you get sick, you know, if you need some company. It's easy to point out the kind of isolationist tendencies of the billionaire class. We can see that and go, ugh, that's ridiculous. When something like COVID and the pandemic happens, we all start to see, well, where is that tendency in ourselves? We start to think about other human beings the way that tech bros do. Oh, they're dirty or contaminated and scary. I need to insulate myself from them. When people start thinking about like prepping, if they're like tech bros, they think, how much food do I have in my basement? How long can I last? And do I have a gun to keep my neighbors out? You can talk to any real prepper and they'll tell you the first thing you think about is, what are the other people on my block doing? They know that you can't prep alone. We were very interested by all this preppers movement in the, in the US. And we got to discover this uh, survival environment in France. And what we liked about it, it was not as uh, hard as uh, US. We found out like the people were more focusing on autonomy and that they believed that auto autonomy could be the, uh, the solution to, to react with more trust uh, facing like uh, what we call a break of uh, normality. What we call the pessimist side, actually they bring solutions. So they're nice people, they're not like people like hiding in their bunkers. That's actually the exact opposite. They're more about sharing. The, the spirit of community is very important as well. So we believe that uh, a group is stronger than individuals. On n'a plus aucune confiance en aucun gouvernement. Donc ce qui les intéresse, c'est pas tellement la paix. C'est ce que ça peut leur apporter euh, au niveau financier, la vente des armes, tous les intérêts économiques euh, de tous les gros groupes euh, industriels. Chacun, euh, avec des petits moyens, on peut arriver euh, à se protéger, à essayer de survivre. J'ai de la chance euh, d'habiter dans une impasse où tout le monde se connaît, on s'entraide tous. Je fais partie d'un groupe aussi euh, d'entraide. De, Donc oui, on s'entraide, oui, on se passe les choses, on se dit les choses. Si vous, vous survivez et, et, et que tous les vôtres sont morts, voilà, aucun intérêt. You get to care about everybody. We're all in this together. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, right? But that's really hard for a lot of us because then you think, oh my God, you mean my fate is dependent on this, on the health of the planet? Yes. You mean my fate is dependent on your fate? Yes. Reddit is a community, in, but only in the ex sense or extent to which an online community can be. If the community occurs in actual relationships between people, living systems, places that they're in. There's species going every day we're losing species. You know, it's like it can't get much clearer than that. I think humanity is it's already well off a cliff and our ability to collectively proactively respond to that is is pretty nil. The loss of hope does not necessitate apathy and action or an activism as they are framing it. If one loses hope, that doesn't mean one stops taking action. To suggest that would mean that all action can only come from hope, which is unfounded even at first glance, let alone a deeper analysis. It's a it's a great time, I think, to accrue the understanding and skills so that we can move forward into this transitionary phase. But there's just so much distraction, and I, I know people need escapes uh, from that to not just walk off a cliff. It's OK to embrace the beauty of this experience, too. A lot of times I feel so obligated to do something about climate change, and then I feel like if I'm, if I'm just writing books or giving talks or helping people experience awe, then I'm like the, the band on the deck of the Titanic playing as it goes down. But then I think, what's more beautiful than being the band on the deck of the Titanic? If it is going down, 